Well, we're on time today. Uh, not ready, but we're on time. Donald Trump's campaign manager and confidant, Steve Bannon, is facing criminal contempt of Congress charges after he failed to cooperate with the January 6th committee. The Justice Department is pursuing this and jury selection began today for his trial. The committee, the January 6th committee, has scheduled its final hearing for this Thursday. The committee has subpoenaed the Secret Service records to determine why they deleted text messages from January 6th. The committee hopes to discover how hard Trump actually fought to be driven to the Capitol after he gave his speech on the ellipse that morning. Well, Roger Stone now claims his speech is protected by the entire First Amendment, not just freedom of speech, but religious freedom as well. Uh, Roger Stone gave a speech on January 5th, firing up his crowd. And here's what Roger Stone said defending his speech. I gave a speech on the night of the 5th. They played a bite of it. Uh, and I, I expressed my apocalyptic view as a Christian that what the country faced was a fight between dark and light, between good and evil, between the godly and the godless. They claim that that was the incitement to violence. No, that's anti-religious bigotry. I have every right to say that. The Constitution enshrines it. But now, free speech of any kind is pointed to as seditious. Uh, the Constitution Constitution doesn't protect you uh doesn't allow you to call for sedition as part of your religious beliefs, your apocalyptic Christian religious beliefs. Meanwhile, the Trump family is mourning the death of Ivana Trump, who died last week. And how does Donald Trump mourn the loss of his beloved first wife? By going on social media to raise money. This is an actual tweet that Donald Trump sent out on his personal social media platform. I am very sad, very sad to inform all of those who loved her, of which there are many that Ivana Trump has passed away at her home in New York City. She was a wonderful, beautiful and amazing woman who I abandoned for someone younger, even though I raped her and should have been kinder. No, you didn't write that. And uh, she was, uh, her pride and joy were her three children, Don Jr., Ivanka and Eric, and then right below that, it says, donate to save America. And he's encouraging people to donate to uh, Donald Trump's next presidential campaign. Well, if you'll remember Friday night, we talked about this. Ivana Trump died from natural causes at the age of 73. Oh, wait. Developing tonight, the medical examiner has ruled Ivana Trump's death an accident, saying that she died due to blunt impact injuries of the torso. The 73 year old was found dead yesterday at the foot of the stairs inside her 64th Street home on the Upper East Side. Reports have suggested that she fell down the stairs. Okay. Uh, first of all, let's not traffic in crazy conspiracy theories. A, a blood, blunt impact injuries to the torso. If you're married to Donald Trump, that's natural causes. L let's not come up with crazy conspiracy theories. It was perfectly normal for his first wife to fall down a flight of stairs. I'm sure a lot of women who were in relationships with Donald Trump fell down flights of steps. Well, how is Donald Trump handling this? He has a big uh, rally scheduled. He had one Friday night scheduled in uh, Arizona, but he had to cancel it because of the death of his uh, wife, first wife, and this is how it was reported in Prescott, Arizona. Just into our newsroom, former President Donald Trump has rescheduled his rally tomorrow in Prescott due to the passing of his ex-wife, Ivana Trump. That rally has been rescheduled for next Friday, we know. We don't yet know where or what time. We'll be sure to keep you posted. That's how much pain Donald is in. Next week, give me a week to mourn. Let me bury her and uh, we'll be back on the road raising. He couldn't even stop raising money right after she died. Well, 
Uh, today, prosecutors said they will seek the death penalty for Nicholas Cruz, who was found guilty of the massacre of 17 people at a Parkland, Florida high school more than four years ago. The federal government is charging that white gunman accused of killing 10 people inside a Buffalo supermarket with a hate crime. The 27 count federal indictment could result in the death penalty for Peyton Gendron, who pled not guilty today. In Japan, the prime minister, Fumio Kishida, blamed the police for last week's assassination of former Japanese prime minister Shinzo Abe. The prime minister blamed the police for not providing proper security. A heat wave is burning through Europe. Great Britain has declared a national emergency with today expected to hit 104 degrees. It's the hottest day on record. Schools and doctor's offices have been closed. People are being told to work from home as train travel has been slowed to a crawl for fear the heat has ruined the tracks. The Conservative Party in England aired televised debates on Sunday among the five members of Parliament who are vying to replace Boris Johnson as leader of the Conservative Party. But because they're conservatives, they seem uh, more fixated on high energy costs than they are on high temperatures. They didn't seem to talk about the heat wave. They just complained about how expensive it was to cause the heat wave, high energy costs. Neoliberalism cannot tackle climate catastrophe. It can only exacerbate it. I'll go back to the heat wave in Europe in a second, but if you want to defeat neoliberalism, you have to vote and you have to capture your government. There's a misunderstanding about what we're up against with neoliberalism. A lot of people think Neoliberals are the same thing as laissez-faire capitalists. They think the neoliberals just want to weaken government so the markets could be freed. And this is not true. Robert Kuttner has a great piece in the New York Review of Books this week. And he writes that neoliberalism is an outgrowth of the New Deal, where conservative economists became neoliberals after they figured out that government is necessary to protect capitalism from democracy. This is really important. This is why you can't give up on government because the neoliberals have not. Conservative economists figured out that government is necessary to protect capitalism from democracy. In other words, too much democracy would destroy capitalism. Professor Harvey J.K. has talked about this on the show about the Trilateral Commission issuing a report in around 1975, 1976, and they said, we have too much democracy around the world. And one of the signatories to that report was Jimmy Carter, a member of the Trilateral Commission, who then got the Democratic nomination and began to deregulate our economy. This is why you have to vote. This is why you cannot let up on our government because the neoliberals will not. The neoliberals have set their eyes not on the free market because there's no such thing as a free market. They have set their sights on our government and they have captured it and we have to take it back. They took over our government to make sure a government of the people wouldn't protect the people from corporate America. The American government is not dysfunctional. It's working exactly for the people who control it. And that would be the neoliberals who represent Wall Street and corporate America. Government, I talk about this all the time, is roughly one third of the economy. So how our government spends its money determines who stays rich and who stays poor. Don't believe the Republicans who tell you that Washington must be destroyed. They don't mean it. They don't want to destroy Washington. That's where their fire hose of cash comes from. Washington, D.C. isn't going anywhere. The neoliberal plan is for people like you and me to think that Wall Street and corporate America don't care about Washington, D.C., so neither should we. Meanwhile, they are using Washington, D.C. as their personal piggy bank. Vote 
get involved. Well, parts of Western France hit triple digits today, as did Italy, with farmers in Milan picking tomatoes before they turn into marinara. That's true. They're, they're picking unripened tomatoes to save them from the heat. This record heat will cause record prices for wheat, vegetables, and food stuff. But Senator Joe Manchin from West Virginia insists inflation is caused by government spending, not his beloved oil companies roasting the planet. Meanwhile, Joe Biden, our president, I think, was in Saudi Arabia over the weekend trying to get them to open up their pumps instead of declaring war on fossil fuels, instead of addressing the American people and saying we have to get off fossil fuel, he's begging the Saudis for more of what's killing us. Now, Biden and the Democrats had a bill that would provide $300 billion in tax incentives for electric cars, as well as solar and wind. But on Friday, it died. It died while President Biden was in Saudi Arabia. It was in Saudi Arabia, of all places, that Joe Biden admitted that his climate change bill was dead. How appropriate that Joe Biden would be in Saudi Arabia, where you'd have to confess that his climate change bill is dead. It's dead because Joe Biden was more concerned about meeting with the Saudis than he was getting climate change legislation passed here in America. Joe Biden was concerned more about more fossil fuels getting pumped out of the ground to kill us than he was trying to pass legislation to keep that oil in the ground. Think about this. Joe Biden has a bill in the Senate to address climate change. He claims he claims he wants it passed and he claims that he's determined to wean our nation off fossil fuels. But where does Biden spend his energy on fossil fuels? He's in Saudi Arabia. But somehow Joe Manchin is the bad guy. Well, yes, he is the bad guy, but he's not as bad as Mohammed bin Salman, the leader of Saudi Arabia, who Biden chose to meet with instead of Joe Manchin. Here's what Biden was asked in, appropriately enough, here's what he was asked in Saudi Arabia about Joe Manchin and the climate change bill. Mr. President, Sir. is Joe Manchin negotiating in good faith? I didn't negotiate with Joe Manchin. I have no idea. I have no idea I didn't negotiate with Joe Manchin. I have no idea. But you negotiate with Mohammed bin Salman. You fly all the way over to Saudi Arabia, but you can't waltz over to the Senate and sit down with Joe Manchin and work something out. No. But that's how Biden sold himself to us in 2020. He was the lion of the Senate. He could work with McConnell. That's what he told us. And back then we knew that was never going to happen. But certainly Biden knew how to deal with members of his own party like Joe Manchin, right? No. Turns out he lied to us. He had no idea how to deal with Joe Manchin. You know, I've talked about this before. After the Sandy Hook massacre in 2012, Obama had just been reelected and he put his vice president, Joe Biden, in charge of passing some kind of assault weapons ban. This was right after Barack Obama was reelected. So he had political capital and he wanted to spend it on gun reform. And not only did he have the political capital of getting reelected, he had the political capital of 20 first graders and six adults getting slaughtered in Sandy Hook. I don't know if you remember this. Uh, Obama had a lot of political capital back then to, to move the needle on an assault weapons ban. You probably don't remember this because so much has happened. But 10 years ago after Sandy Hook, the NRA was running scared. Wayne LaPierre went into hiding. And then a week after the shooting, Wayne LaPierre, the CEO of the National Rifle Association, he finally materialized and he came out with an unhinged speech, at least 
It seemed unhinged back then. Now it comes across as per perfectly reasonable. This was about 10 years ago. And Wayne LaPierre, people thought he had lost his mind. He said the solution to school shootings was more guns. He said we needed to arm teachers and schools needed more armed guards. And you have to understand that 10 years ago, this was crazy talk. This is what he said. Trust me, this was considered insane 10 years ago. Our children, we as a society leave them every day utterly defenseless. And the monsters and the predators of the world know it and exploit it. That must change now. Okay, so those of you watching were treated to the visual of Wayne LaPierre's speech interrupted silently by a gigantic pink flag that read NRA kills children. It was from Code Pink. So but the NRA 10 years ago was on life support. Like I said, Obama had just been reelected. There was this massacre at Sandy Hook. The Republicans still had the House, but the Democrats had the Senate. And practically, if there was any time you could get some kind of gun reform, that was the time. And Biden was sent by Obama to the Capitol to make a deal because Joe Biden was vice president because he was the lion of the Senate, the lying lion of the Senate. Turns out he really wasn't that good at making deals, but that's how he sold himself to Obama and the American people. Biden has spent his entire life in the Senate. That's all he knows. He's had one job his entire life. He was 30 years old when he got elected to the Senate. He knows the Senate, so people automatically assume he knows how to get bills passed, right? Let me tell you something. If somebody is pushing 80 and they've had one job since they were 30, fire them. They're idiots. They're idiot savants. With Biden, it's, he's not even a savant. Anyway, Obama put him in charge of getting some kind of assault weapons bill passed. And Joe Biden worked personally with Joe Manchin, who had just arrived at the Senate. And the bill that was presented was called Manchin Toomey. It was Manchin, of all people, who reached across the aisle to bring Pennsylvania Senator and Republican Pat Toomey on board. And, and they proposed mansion to me. It was toothless, but it was something, and it died. How did Biden help get it passed? He did nothing. He never picked up a phone. A Democratic Senate aide told the Washington Post earlier this year about mansion to me. Biden's role, this is a quote, Biden's role in that was a joke. This is from a former Democratic Senate aide who was speaking uh, anonymously. He said, Biden could fight his way out of a paper bag. Biden did not move one single person on this bill. It was Manchin who got to me, and Manchin is the one who really put things together. So when it comes to negotiating with Manchin, trying to make Manchin happy, you know who knows that Joe Biden is a cipher? Joe Manchin. It is Manchin who has Biden's number, not the other way around. Biden does not scare Joe Manchin. Manchin learned a decade ago on Manchin to me. He learned this firsthand that Biden is a cipher. He learned that Biden, Biden was a lot of bluster and pretty much uh, on his side, on Manchin's side, when it came to important issues like government spending. You know, Manchin fancies himself as a fiscal hawk, and uh, I don't think he and Biden have uh, too much to disagree on when it comes to Social Security and entitlements. Here is Joe Biden back in 1997 
I, when I argued that we should freeze federal spending, I meant Social Security as well. I meant Medicare and Medicaid. I meant veterans benefits. I meant every single solitary thing in the government. And I not only tried it once, I tried it twice, I tried it a third time, and I tried it a fourth time. Somebody has to tell me in here how we're going to do this hard work without dealing with any of those sacred cows. How about you protect the sacred cows because they're sacred, Joe? That's who Biden is. Now, let's talk about Biden misspeaking all the time. Did he sound like he couldn't talk back then? He was pretty articulate. His cognitive ability was pretty sharp back then. That's why he was the darling of the Sunday morning shows. You couldn't turn on a television set on a Sunday morning with Joe, without Joe Biden being on one of those talk shows, because back then he was incredibly sharp. And, you know, now they say, well, he was born with a stutter and that's why he makes mistakes when he speaks. Well, I didn't see the stutter 20 years ago or even 10 years ago. He used to be incredibly articulate, but this is Biden over the weekend calling our soldiers he was in he was in saudi arabia and he called our soldiers selfish we'll always honor the bravery and selfishness selflessness of the and sacrifices of the americans who serve is that the same guy uh is this the same guy is it you, you tell me is this the same guy I, when I argued that we should freeze federal spending, I meant Social Security as well. I meant Medicare and Medicaid. I meant that's Medicaid. not the same guy. Here is Joe Biden on the same trip to the Middle East. Here he is at Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Memorial, thanking the Nazis. Which we must do every, every day, continue to bear witness. To keep alive the truth and honor of the Holocaust, horror of the Holocaust. Honor the truth and honor of the Holocaust. You know, as we get older, we're more prone to Freudian slips. Now, not everyone ages the same way. Take Bernie. Bernie Sanders is 80. My mother was perfectly lucid well into her 80s. Some would say too lucid. I could have used some short-term and long-term memory loss. It would have been a lot easier to be around her. I look at Bernie, I see my mother. This is Bernie on Sunday's ABC this week. This is Bernie, uh, this is Bernie yesterday. On the Democrats' no, Martha, plans you didn't to abruptly. pass- Martha, oh, oh, okay, Martha, let, 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 okay. he disagree. abruptly on Friday He didn't did abruptly that. do anything. He was he negotiating for a while. He has sabotaged the president's agenda. No, uh, look, if you check the record six months ago, I made it clear. But you have people like Manchin, Cinema, Cinema to a lesser degree, who are intentionally sabotaging the president's agenda, what the American people want, what a majority of us in the Democratic caucus want. Nothing new about this. And the problem was that we continue to talk to Manchin like he was serious. He was not. This is a guy who is a major recipient of fossil fuel money, a guy who has received campaign contributions from 25 Republican billionaires. Okay, okay uh, Senator, I no. want, I, I, okay, you say he wasn't serious, but Manchin says his main goal is to do what's good for West Virginia, and he's worried about inflation. Listen to what he told the really, West Virginia really. radio station. Listen to Really, really. This is how Bernie deals with Manchin. Now, look, Manchin, as I said, his first introduction to the Senate was dealing with Joe Biden on the assault weapons ban, and he realized that Biden was weak. Manchin knows Biden isn't tough. He does know that that Bernie is to be feared. And whether you like it or not, that's what politics, that's what politics is, fear. Power is fear. In politics, you win by making those around you terrified. There are consequences to not agreeing with me. Nobody is afraid of Joe Biden. Let's get back to, to Bernie now. He was on ABC this week on Sunday, and Manchin is saying he can't pass a climate bill because of inflation. Manchin says we can't have government spending because 
that causes inflation, even though inflation is rampant throughout the world, he insists it's our government spending that's causing inflation. Like I said on Friday's show, uh, 30%, about 30% of inflation is housing costs. You want to lower inflation? You spend more money to build more homes. You create more of a supply. Raising interest rates, that's instead that's what they're doing at the Federal Reserve, it's anti-democratic. Nobody elected Jerome Powell. Raising interest rates is not democratic. Why does Jerome Powell over at the Federal Reserve get to dictate how America fights inflation? There are other ways to combat inflation instead of jump-starting a recession, which is exactly what Jerome Powell is promising to do. He's making borrowing so expensive that people won't be able to buy homes or start businesses. Well, no matter how high you raise interest rates, it's not gonna bring down the price of oil or food. You know what would? Ending the war in Ukraine. That's, that's what would bring down inflation. Gee, I wonder how Ukraine is going. Let's check and see. We have, you know, 70, 80 billion dollars available for for Ukraine. Uh, let's see. Uh, how is that going? I, I think we have some information. I thought we did. OK, we don't. Oh, yeah, we do. OK, let, let's see how Ukraine is going. Tonight, Russia ramping up its ruthless attacks on civilians. The eastern city of Dnipro, the latest target. Videos circulating online showing locals watching as missiles rain down. Ukrainian officials confirming at least three people killed in the attack. A U.S. official saying Russian strikes killing up to 150 innocent people in just the past two weeks. And new details tonight on Russia's deadly attack on the city of Vinitsa in central Ukraine. A U.S. official saying the missiles were fired from a submarine, adding there was no sign of a military target in the area. Among those killed, four-year-old Lisa, seen in this video, thought to be taken just before the attack. This, her stroller at the scene. Her mother tonight in intensive care. Her family telling us she's unaware her daughter is dead. So it's not going particularly well for Ukraine. Zelensky had to purge his cabinet. A security detail. It's rife, rampant with spies. And uh, it's not going well. It's not going well for Ukraine. Seems to me we should start negotiating. Even Henry Kissinger says we have to negotiate. Not only that, if we negotiate, uh, it will make the price of oil and food go down. It turns out peace is uh, how you fight inflation. We had rampant inflation in the 70s because of the spending on the Vietnam War. So peace, you want, you want to get rid of inflation and the war and, and the war in Ukraine. You know what else causes inflation? Uh, major supply chain disruptions. And you know what causes major supply chain disruptions? Climate change that causes inflation. There are ways to bring down inflation other than raising interest rates and causing a recession, if not a depression. If you want to bring down the cost of health care, well, you make it free. You have the government pay for it. You want to bring down the cost of medicine? Allow Medicare to negotiate with the pharmaceutical companies. That's how you bring down inflation. You want to bring down the cost of education? Make it free. There isn't a, there isn't a logical uh, argument to say that government spending causes inflation. Manchin is just spreading another lie. Well, here's Bernie talking back to Joe Manchin on Sunday. Manchin says he won't consider any new spending bills. And by the way, it's all up to him. He won't consider any new spending bills until he gets more information on inflation. He says if he senses inflation is under control, then he would be willing to consider passing a climate bill. He's worried about inflation. The planet has seven more years left. We'll all be dead. But at least Joe Manchin made sure that the dollar was strong. So Joe Manchin is worried about inflation. Uh, 
The record heat is causing a drought, forcing Italy to ration water. This is the future. I'll play uh, Bernie uh, in a second. This is the future. It's here. In Spain today, a train was forced to come to a complete halt, engulfed in smoke, surrounded by flames. A panicked passenger posted this video on Twitter. Take a look at this. What's he doing? Look at that. This is terrifying. The train in Spain fails mainly without rain. You think these people are worried that government spending on a climate bill is going to cause inflation? This is exactly why and I'm frozen. Am I back? This is why everybody hates America. Spain has mass transit. 75% of the cost of gasoline is taxes. Spain purposely jacks up the price of gas to encourage its citizens to take the train. And now, because of America refusing to pass climate change legislation, the planet continues to heat up. And that's Spain's reward for using mass transit, being engulfed in flames from global warming. They're doing their part. Spain is doing their part. 43% of Spain's electricity comes from renewable energy. Uh, in about eight years, 80% of their electricity will come from renewable energy. Spain is doing their part like most of Europe, but America refuses. And that's why we've lost our moral authority around the world. Who's responsible for those fires engulfing that train? Not Spain. America, only 12% of America's energy consumption is renewable. America is responsible for at least 30% of the world's greenhouse gases. Uh, and China, too. But the only reason China is producing all those greenhouse gases is we are propping up their economy by buying all their useless shit that we don't need. Here's more of Spain and... Uh, Portugal. Take a look at this. this is Spain and Portugal. Italy and Spain spent the weekend frying from a record setting heat wave. But Manchin says we have to worry about inflation. That's what we have to worry about. The big problem is inflation. Uh, here's Bernie talking back to Joe Manchin about uh, inflation. People should have health care as a human right, like in every other country on earth. That's what they will say. Inflation is absolute. Inflation is absolutely killing many, many people. They can't buy gasoline. They have a hard time buying groceries. Everything they buy and consume for their daily lives is a hardship to them. Your reaction to that, Senator? Well, look, the same nonsense the mansion has been talking about for a year. West Virginia, it's a beautiful state. I've had the pleasure of being there. Great people. It is one of the poorest states in this country. You ask the people of West Virginia whether they want to expand Medicare to cover dental, hearing, and eyeglasses. You ask the people of West Virginia whether we should demand that the wealthiest people in large corporations start paying their fair share of taxes. Ask the people of West Virginia whether or not all people should have health care as a human right like in every other country on earth. That's what they will say. In my humble opinion, you know, Manchin represents the very wealthiest people in this country, not working families in West Virginia or America. Well, let's ask Joe Biden what, uh, what he has to say. Which we must do every, every day, continue to bear witness, to keep alive the truth and honor of the Holocaust, horror of the hol Holocaust. Oh, I don't know. Seems to me you got your climate change, you got your inflation, your gun violence, you got your homelessness. Seems to be Bernie is the antidote to Trump, in my humble opinion, not the dotard. That's an actual word and it hasn't been. You're still allowed to. <laughs> I think you're still allowed to call Joe Biden a dotard. I think I think it's OK. I don't think enough people have used the word dotard. Uh, to say that's politically incorrect. So I will continue to call Joe Biden a dotard. <laughs> Maybe I should pronounce it properly. Well, uh, you know, one of the people who does quite well on Fox News, 
is Bernie Sanders. I don't know if you saw his debate against Lindsey Graham on Fox News last month. He wiped the floor with Lindsey Graham. Here is Fox News' Maria Bordaroma trying to get uh, to the bottom of Joe Biden's cognitive misfunctions. Congressman, there were signs that Joe Biden was declining during the 2020 campaign. I mean, let's face it. He stayed in the basement the whole time during during the campaign. Well, 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 but you know, that, that's not fair. There was COVID. I, I know people who watch Fox didn't know about COVID. That's unfair. Anyway, she's talking with Texas Republican Congressman Ronnie Jackson about Joe Biden's cognitive decline. This is Texas Congressman. He's a freshman. Ronnie Jackson. Um, so who knew what when? Are they hiding this? And, and feeding him drugs to, to, to allow him to function. I know he goes home to Delaware a lot more than any other president. So I guess my question is, what did Obama know? What did Jill Biden know? And who's running the White House right now? And are they covering up for these uh, mental uh, issues? Well, that's the big question everybody's asking. Who's really pulling the strings? Who's running the country right now? We don't really know the answer to that. We don't know. You know, when Obama was president, Fox News, it was unfair to ask the questions about Obama. These are legitimate questions that Maria Bartiromo is asking. Where was Jill Biden? Where was Barack Obama? They worked, they knew Joe Biden intimately. Uh, it's political malfeasance. Anyway, this is, let's go back to Congressman Ronnie Jackson. Um, so who knew what when? Are they hiding this? and covering up for these uh, uh, issues. Well, that's the big question everybody's asking. Who's really pulling the strings? Who's running the country right now? We don't really know the answer to that. We don't know if it's Susan Ross or Ron Klain or if it's Jill Biden or who it is, but somebody else is doing this. They're doing exactly what you said. They're rolling him out at specific times during the day. He's got good days and bad days, good, uh, you know, and, and whether or not they have him on drugs, I don't know. There are drugs out there that can increase your alertness and your memory and things of that nature, you know, and cover st stuff like this up temporarily. So I'm sure some of that's going on as well, but we don't know. Yeah, that is... Uh uh, F me. That is, there I am. That is Congressman Ronnie Jackson, Republican and good old boy from Texas. He represents Texas's 13th district. And he might know a thing or two about what drugs a president should take to pump up his cognitive skills. That's because Ronnie is not just a good old boy. He's an actual doctor, not just any doctor. He was Donald Trump's doctor back when Trump was president. And Trump loved Ronnie Jackson because Ronnie's the kind of doctor who does what he's told and he flatters the patient. When he would brief the press on Trump's health, Dr. Jackson said Trump's mind was incredibly sharp. He, uh, he agreed to give Trump a few extra inches in order to classify Trump as obese as opposed to morbidly obese. You know, he made him taller so his weight only seemed obese as opposed to morbidly obese. Jackson said during the press briefings that Donald Trump could live to 200. His genes were just that good. So, of course, Donald Trump loved Ronnie Jackson, Dr. Ronnie Jackson. And so in 2018, Trump nominated Ronnie Jackson to head our Department of Veterans Affairs. Oops. Cabinet secretaries have to be confirmed, and some stuff came out. For example, Dr. Ronnie Jackson was known inside the White House as the Candy Man. Vanity Fair reports that Dr. Jackson handed out prescriptions to White House staffers for whatever they wanted, whenever they wanted. There was no paperwork. He just handed them the pills. And apparently the drug of choice inside the Trump White House uh, was Ambien and then Provigil. You uh, take Ambien to sleep and you take Provigil to concentrate the mind. One of the side effects of Provigil and Ambien is hallucinations. So it's safe to say that the entire Trump administration was getting candy from Dr. Jackson. The candy man reportedly had his own drinking problem. He drunkenly crashed a government car after returning home from a Secret Service party. 
There were reports of his traveling with the president and loudly pounding on hotel doors of female staffers wanting to get in. So eventually the Defense Department's inspector general had a look into Dr. Ronnie Jackson. And despite major stonewalling from the White House, the Defense Department's inspector general concluded that there were mountains of evidence that Dr. Ronnie Jackson from the great state of Texas, there was mountains of evidence that he drank to excess, verbally abused his staff, sexually harassed the women who work for him. He bullied the women. He disparaged them behind their backs. He yelled, he screamed, and he created a toxic workplace inside the White House. And so he was finished. He had to withdraw his nomination for secretary of Veterans Affair, and he was left with no choice. He was he was damaged goods. So he was left with no choice but to run for Congress as a Republican in Texas. And he won in Texas as a Republican. He won. He took office on January 3rd, 2021. In just enough time to vote against certifying the presidential election for Joe Biden. He attended the January 6th Stop the Steal rally, where President Trump instructed his followers to storm the Capitol. And Congressman Ronnie Jackson was inside the Capitol later that day during the insurrection. According to the Texas Tribune, the Oath Keepers exchanged texts during the siege, concerned about protecting the life of Congressman Ronnie Jackson. Jackson. In those texts, the leader of the Oath Keepers, Stuart Rhodes, by the way, we looked it up, he did graduate from Yale Law School. Uh, the leader of the Oath Keepers, Stuart Rhodes, texted his followers during the siege. They, he told them to give Dr. Ronnie Jackson his cell phone number if he needs any help getting out of the Capitol. Other members of the Oath Keepers exchanged texts advising each other that they should keep an eye out for Congressman Dr. Ronnie Jackson so they can keep him safe because he, quote, has critical data to protect, unquote. Well, this year it's midterms and Dr. Ronnie Jackson is running for re-election. Now, despite his past with Donald Trump and the Oath Keepers and, you know, drinking, crashing government cars, harassing women, uh, he has kind of settled into the job of representing Texas's 13th congressional district. Uh, the solemnity of being a United States congressman has obviously taken hold. He's running for re-election. And here's a, a statement that uh, Congressman Ronnie Jackson issued early this morning. Hey, everybody, this is Congressman Ronnie Jackson from the great state of Texas. I have a message for the Biden administration. If you're thinking about taking our ARs, you can start here in Texas. On behalf of all the law abiding gun owners in the state of Texas, I just want to say, come and get it. Come and get it, which is exactly what he used to scream to Trump White House staffers as he waved a bottle of Ambien and another bottle of Provigil. Come and get it. That is doctor and congressman and Republican Ronnie Jackson, who you can't uh, see this if you're listening. He was holding not one, but two AR-15s as he made that statement. He made that statement on the same day, Sunday, a Texas House committee issued its report on what went wrong during the Evalde, Texas shooting that killed 19 students and two teachers on May 24th. This is Texas Republican State Representative Dustin Burroughs. He represents Lubbock, Texas, and he is the chairman of the committee that was formed on July 3rd to get to the bottom of what, what, what happened in Uvalde, Texas. In its 77-page report, his committee isolated the two major causes of the slaughter. Well, obviously, the, the number one cause is that anyone in Texas can walk into a gun store and buy an assault weapon, no questions asked, right? Texas Republican State Representative Dustin Burroughs, right? If you know, and the training and standards we set for officers is if you know 
there is active shooting, active killing going on, or somebody is dying. The standard is you have to continue to do something to stop that killing or stop that dying. That day, several officers in the hallway or in that building knew or should have known there was dying in that classroom. And they should have done more, acted with urgency, tried the door handles, tried to go in through the windows, tried to distract him, tried to do something to address the situation. So it was the police officer's fault. Again, I, I thought the first problem would be how easy it is to purchase assault weapons, but I don't live in Texas. What do I know? So first, it was the cowardice of the Uvalde police. That's kind of disrespectful to our nation's police. I mean, every day we witness acts of bravery committed by our police all over America. For example, take Rochester, New York, where Dan lives. This is uh, what happened a week ago today. This is what happened in Rochester, New York. Our brave police officers whose reputations are being sullied unfairly. The incident happened on Monday. The ambulance bay in front of the emergency room is typically reserved for ambulances only, but the investigator was parked there planning to go inside for a case. Sources tell me that's when the EMT from Monroe Ambulance got out to get the patient out. Her door hit the police car. The investigator asked for identification, but the EMT was intent on getting her patient inside. She kept moving with the man on a stretcher, and this is what happened while she was at the check-in desk. This is a white police officer. The beating. Rochester Police Department tells me the investigator in this video has been placed on administrative assignment. And quote, at the direction of Chief Smith, the professional standards section is currently conducting an internal investigation. Monroe Ambulance says it's waiting for the outcome of that investigation, but believes its EMT was appropriately singularly focused on patient care. So that is a uh, that is a white that is a white police officer. Uh, in case you didn't notice, if you're listening, that is a, an EMT, uh, uh, an African American woman getting uh, arrested, roughly by a white police officer. Talk about police bravery! This is what happened: a, a police officer is parking where the ambulances are only allowed to park. A black female EMT arrives with someone on a stretcher, trying to rush them into the emergency room. And apparently, she opened the door of her ambulance, and it hit the cop car. And she kept going. She didn't look at the dent. She didn't apologize. She cared more about wheeling the patient into the emergency room. And this cop bravely raced into the emergency room. Did I mention he's white? And while this black EMT was attending to the patient on the stretcher in the emergency room, this white cop threw the black female EMT up against the wall, violently handcuffed and arrested her. Do you realize the courage that takes to arrest an ambulance driver in the middle of attending to a patient inside the emergency room? I mean, this woman slammed her ambulance door against a police car that was illegally parked in an ambulance parking space, and he arrested her. You know, that's courage to be that big of an asshole. Anyway, I digress. Back to the slaughter in Evalde, where close to 400, 600 police officers stood around while one kid with an AR-15 slaughtered all those children. Okay, so there's a special committee uh, down in uh, Texas, and they looked into what happened, the systemic failure, as they call it, and uh, they say it's the cop's fault. Okay, uh, that's one reason uh, it was a massacre. But you said there was a second reason for the massacre. What was the second reason this uh, turned out so, so bad? With hindsight, we can say the Robb Elementary was not adequately prepared for the risk of a school shooter. The school's five-foot fence was inadequate. Despite a policy of locked doors, there was a regrettable culture of noncompliance. In fact, all three exterior doors to the building were unlocked that day, 
and multiple interior doors were not secured the day of the shooting. Ah, it was the school's fault. It was the fault of our police and the fault of our teachers for not adequately preparing for a school shooting. I see. So it 77 page report, not a single mention of the guns. No, hang on. We're getting a report from Rafael Sanchez, who's standing by outside Indiana's Greenwood Park Mall. He has some uh, late breaking news. Rafael? Rafael Sanchez outside of the Greenwood Park Mall on the report of a possible active shooter here at the Greenwood Park Mall. As you can see, there's a lot of police activity around the entire mall area. People were evacuated from inside the mall. The mall, I'm told, closes at 6. We're waiting for a police briefing to get more information about what is going on. But what we can see so far is law enforcement that is heavily armed. We can see a number of ambulances. In fact, we could also see police agencies from Martinsville, Southport, here. Uh, responding as well as Greenwood police. As soon as I get more information about what exactly is happening here, I will share that with you. And Greenwood, Rafael Sanchez, WRTV. Thank you, Rafael. Well, it turns out while Texas politicians were blaming the police and teachers for the shooting in Uvalde, Texas, at the same time, a lone gunman killed three people inside a Greenwood, Indiana mall. Greenwood, Indiana Police Chief James Eisen today held a press conference. Here's uh, what he had to say. The shooter was confronted by our Good Samaritan, who I will identify in just a moment. Uh, the Good Samaritan was armed with a pistol and engaged the uh, shooter as he stood outside the restaurant restroom area firing into the food court. Shooter fired several rounds, striking the suspect. The suspect attempted to retrieve, ba retreat back into the restroom and fail, fell to the ground after being shot. We recovered 24 223 rifle rounds shot by the suspect and 10 uh, handgun rounds fired by the Good Samaritan. Fired by the Good Samaritan, the Suspect was reportedly killed by what the Greenwood police chief just described as a good Samaritan who shot the suspect to death. Greenwood police chief Jim Eisen told reporters that he's the real hero of the day. It is the citizen, this is the quote, that was lawfully carrying a firearm in that food court and was able to stop the shooter almost as soon as it began. Yes, almost as soon as it began, you know, three innocent people dead, two injured, but he stopped the shooter. The Good Samaritan stopped the shooter almost as soon as he began. Couldn't stop the shooter from killing three innocent people, injuring two, but the Good Samaritan stopped the shooter almost as soon as he began. On July 1st of this year, Indiana no longer requires a permit for citizens to carry or conceal a handgun. And I'm sure the right will spin this as a triumph, right? Guns save lives. Only three dead, four if you include the shooter, and only two injured because that gun, that, that, that good Samaritan had a gun and he was able to stop it from getting a lot worse because this is what we all want inside a mall, inside a food court, a shootout. Can you imagine if the police showed up while the Good Samaritan was hard at work, Samaritan, and, and the police see two guys inside the food court firing at each other? And, you know, the cops would immediately know who the Good Samaritan with a gun is, right? Because, you know, cops can tell a Good Samaritan just by looking at them. They have, you know, Good Samaritan dar. They, they, they know the good Samaritan killed the shooter. That's the police chief. That is police chief uh, Jim Eisen, Greenwood police chief, celebrating the fact that everybody's allowed to carry a concealed weapon in Indiana. Good guy, good Samaritan. You all know Jesus's parable of the Good Samaritan, right? A, a traveler is heading from Jerusalem to Jericho. He gets robbed, beaten, stripped naked on the side of the road. 
Nobody would help him until a Samaritan arrived and shot him to death. I, I think that is the parable of the Good Samaritan. Well, after that shooting, while Uvalde, uh, while the House Committee, the State House Committee, was blaming teachers and police for the slaughter in Uvalde, uh, right after the shooting in Indiana at the Greenwood Mall, nine miles away, there was another shooting yesterday in Beech Grove, Indiana, just nine miles away from that mall shooting where four people were shot, one fatally. That was in Beech Grove, Indiana. The mayor, Dennis Buckley, held a press conference today and said his town, his town had no ambulances available since they were, the ambulances were nine miles away uh, assisting the victims in the Greenwood Mall shooting. So, and there were no good Samaritans in Beech Grove, Indiana, uh, to kill the suspect. So uh, the suspect reportedly in this shooting drove away without any Samaritans decent enough to shoot him to death. Uh, we need more good Samaritans in this country. The Samaritans, you need to, you need to step up, Samaritans. The shooting occurred inside a park. Police are asking residents of Indiana to be on the lookout for a newer model white Toyota Camry. And if you see that car, please shoot at it. Please kill the person driving it. That is, uh, I think that's what the police want you to do. If you see a newer model white Toyota Camry, it's probably the guy who shot up Beach Grove, Indiana. So if you have a gun, shoot at, just shoot at any newer model white Toyota Camry. You'll eventually hit, hit the person who uh, did the shooting. Whew. By the way, New York Times has an interesting story today about Good Samaritans. Apparently, uh, we don't have uh, any, we don't have enough Good Samaritans with guns in America. Times has this new report today from the, they talk about the, this report from the Advanced Law Enforcement Rapid Response Training Center at Texas State University. Uh, their researchers work with the FBI to keep track of incidents involving active shooters. In a study of about 433 active shooter attacks, now an active shooter attack, this is when a shooter is in a public place firing randomly at people. And we averaged one active shooter a week last year. This is different from a mass shooting. This is an active shooter. An active shooter is in a public space. We have one a week last year. We have one mass shooting a day, one active shooter a week. Well, according to the New York Times, about half of the shootings end with the shooter killing himself or fleeing. That's how half of those active shootings end. One third of the shooters end up subdued by the police or killed by the police. Only 22 out of 433 active shooter incidents ended when someone shot back, right? A good Samaritan. 10 of those were off-duty cops or security guards. So out of 433 active shooter incidents, 10 times, a regular ordinary citizen carrying a gun took out the shooter. 10 out of 433 active shooter incidents ended with an ordinary citizen firing their weapon. Do you like those odds? You really think it really think that keeps us safe? Adam Langford is a professor at the University of Alabama. He studies mass shootings, and he told the Times, quote, we're looking at direct, indisputable, empirical evidence that this kind of common claim that the only thing that stops a bad guy with the gun is a good guy with the gun is wrong. It's demonstrably false. He goes on to say the actual data show that some of these kind of heroic Hollywood moments of armed citizens taking out active shooters are just extraordinarily rare. And, you know, we saw that Sunday. We saw an armed, I'm sorry, a good Samaritan taking out an active shooter, uh, but not before three people were killed 
and two injured. Uh, it's not like people with guns are stopping active shooters from killing people. They're just, you know, people are still getting shot to death by active shooters. Uh, anyway, this is uh, especially disturbing. Uh, on Saturday night, the Comedy Zone in Charlotte, North Carolina, where comedian Craig Robinson was scheduled to appear, was emptied out after a gunman entered and began firing. Nobody was injured, and uh, the suspect was taken into custody and subdued. That is uh, America today. That is America today. Mm -hmm.